These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. Well, let's start by uh, reviewing this reaction. So let's go through uh, the mechanism of what would happen here. Got a pencil? No, I forgot. Should I send you one? Here you go. Okay. Looks like we should review that reaction, actually. <laughs> okay, so to start with, can you see anybody here who would be a good candidate for being at the head or the tail of an electron pushing arrow? Uh, they don't. Should that be at a head or a tail? Okay, good. No. There you go. Okay. There's a couple other issues we should clear up there, too. So let's just go through this together now. So um, this should be at the tail. Now, what makes it reasonable for this to be at the tail of an arrow? Because we know that the lavon can be an electrophile. A nucleophile to attack the H site. Nucleophile or electrophile? Nucleophile. Nucleophile, that's right. Now, in the past, we've seen that nucleophiles had lone pairs or negative charges. Uh, but this is a new way to be a nucleophile, to have pi electrons. Pi electrons are less happy than sigma electrons, so they'd like to go someplace more stable. Okay. Um, so this is a good candidate for a tail here because um, uh, it's in the pi bond. In fact, this is a new hand down. So when we're talking about, uh, it's very important to have rules that tell you who is it reasonable to put at the head or the tail of an arrow. Because remember, you can expect to see situations on the test you've never seen before, and so you have to have general principles for uh, attacking that. All right, so in this, uh, this new handout that I gave you guys, is I tried to summarize who goes at heads and who goes at tails <coughs> of arrows. So we should be looking uh, at the middle of the table here, reactivity without charges. That is, here we have no charges. Uh, and we've seen in the past, um, a, a good nucleophile could be someone with a lone pair. Or it could be a carbon with a partial minus, but now we're seeing another nucleophile, which is a carbon-carbon pi bond. So we just basically have to memorize uh, that a carbon-carbon pi bond uh, would give us a nucleophile. Okay, so that should be at the tail. All right, and now who would be reasonable to put at the head of this arrow? Yeah, and why is it reasonable for the hydrogen to be at the, the head? Because it's partially positive. Partially positive. That's right. So that's also uh, in the middle of the handout on the right-hand side. Electrophiles tend to have partial positives and good leaving groups. Well, this has a partial positive and a good leaving group. And we can't forget this arrow over here. Okay. So I think that earlier uh, you might have made kind of a very common mistake, which is to draw the, the arrow from the hydrogen to the bond. The reason why that's so common is because people start to think that the arrow is supposed to show which way the hydrogen is moving. Uh, but remember, the whole point of the arrows is to show us which way the electrons are moving. And the electrons are moving towards the hydrogen because it has a partial positive. That's a common error, but it's one that you definitely want to keep practicing until you can uh, avoid that because that can definitely mess us up. I have a question. Does any of this have to do with NMR? Or are we going to get there? Uh, yeah. So the specific thing we're talking about here has uh, nothing particularly to do with NMR. NMR is a technique for figuring out the structure of a molecule. 
NMR is a technique for figuring out the structure of a molecule. Uh, what we're going over here is if you know the structure, how will it react? So those are definitely uh, different things. Um, so I was thinking that today we would start with reactions, uh, and then if we have time, we might go on to NMR or do that on Sunday, if that sounds okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was just wondering, in the next Friday, we should do a very intense NMR session because we have a quiz. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and uh, one thing to keep in mind as we're going through these reactions, I, I think I've used the analogy before, the reactions are like the, the chess, like chess pieces. This is like learning how to play chess. And remember, when you're learning how to play chess, um, it's not acceptable to, um, be, to know how the pieces move if it takes you more than a couple of seconds to come up with that. We need to really have internalized exactly how the pieces move. So here we have to really internalize these reactions as well. Uh, but that comes with practice. All we can do right now is just lay out how the pieces move. But then you've got to do a lot of repetitious practice so that you really start to get a feel for how they move. So you don't have to think about each step. And why is it so important not to have to think about each step? Because in the test, you're probably going to have to put three or four or five reactions together in a row. And the only way you can do that is if the reactions um, uh, feel comfortable to you. Okay, so going through this, uh, so now we want to draw what the product would be from this step. So let's make sure we can draw the correct intermediate from this step. having seen in the past. We're trying to draw what the arrows tell us to do. The arrows tell us what to do. Uh, so uh, going through this here, I'll go ahead and number this. One, two, three, four, and five. Uh, so let's just go through these one by one. Uh, who's the number one carbon attached to? Number two. Who's the number two attached to? And now, actually, we have a question. Um, it's not really clear where the hydrogen is going to end up, on the 2 or the 4. So maybe we'll hold off on that for a second. The 4 is attached to the 5. Now, clearly, we're going to be erasing this pi bond, because the tail is on the pi bond. Um, but then we have to ask, where are we going to put the hydrogen? Well, we need to keep in mind, um, if the hydrogen goes on the number 2, then there's going to be a carbocation on the number 4. Or if the hydrogen goes on the number 4, there will be a carbocation on the number 2. So it's going to go on the number 4. The hydrogen. That's right because that would put the carbocation on the number two. Why do we prefer to put the carbocation on the number two? Because it's more substituted. Yeah, it's more substituted. And why is that better? Because alkyl groups are electron donating. It's crucial to memorize that alkyl, alkyl groups, carbon chains, are electron donating. Can you see OK? You can move over to the side of the decimal line. OK. All right, so uh, yeah, so when uh, this type of arrow here is a little bit ambiguous, because it's not clear who's forming the new bond, the number two or the number four. But clearly, one of these will form a bond, and one will get a carbocation. Um, well, then we should use our knowledge of stability to say here we want to put the carbocation on the more substituted, the number two. So the number four is going to get the hydrogen. Uh, and should you actually draw the hydrogen? Well, it's up to you. This would be a hidden hydrogen, so some people would draw it, and some people would leave it out, uh, whatever you like. The key thing is to get the carbocation in the right place. All right, and we're not done unless we say what happened to the bromine over here. Now remember, we should always be changing two charges at the initial tail and the final head. Well, we decided that the number two was at the initial tail. It was the one that was losing the electron, so it became positive. And uh, the bromine here was at the final head, so it became negative. So I think that maybe um, you guys might have been uh, thinking about confusing this with a different reaction, because I saw some of you were writing like cyclic intermediates. Uh, well, that's a different reaction, basically. And that's a good example of why we don't want to try to draw kind. Uh, we don't want to draw a reaction that we remember having seen before, because it might not be the right reaction. We want to draw the reaction that is dictated by the arrows. So that's what we have to do for everything. Are you sure you can see from there? You might want to sit off to the side. Okay, 
so that gives us uh, this step over here. The tricky aspect of this was, again, this arrow is actually ambiguous. It doesn't tell you who's forming the bond and who's getting the carbocation, but we use our outside knowledge that more stabilized carbocations are better here. 